Yeah. Hope everybody's paying attention today because I have Ed Martin calling in from Missouri, and he's an attorney who's representing several January 6th defendants, and I want to welcome him to the show. We're going to talk about a few things about the Supreme Court and a few other things that involve the January 6th date that is the biggest issue in the country right now. So welcome to the show, Ed. How you doing? I'm great, John. Thank you for having me on. You know, the one thing I scratch my head about when you look at you know, both sides, and then you look at the Supreme Court. Are we challenging the Supreme Court now in America where where they have no power? Well, I mean, look, uh, there's a couple of ways to think about that. For about 50 years, the left wanted to use the courts to get things done that the people didn't want to do. Um, you know, if you're if you're conservative on some issues like abortion, like I am, the whole Roe v. Wade decision was made up by the courts. And then one after another, they would go to court, the left, and they would try to get a single judge to do something that the people wouldn't want to do. Now that the court is more conservative and I think sticking to the Constitution, I feel like the left and and the, and the um, you know, Democrats especially want to try to destabilize the court. They want to say the Supreme Court is, you know, not the ones we should rely on and that we should ask questions about their background and their spouses and all this kind of stuff and, and try to delegitimize the court. You know, look, our Supreme Court should not be running our country. That's not how it works. They are a certain, they play a certain role and I hope that they play that role well, but uh, we shouldn't want our, our, our system dominated by the courts. It should be dominated by free and fair elections in which representatives are elected uh, to serve we the people. That's the, that's the way it's supposed to work. So um, I think we're straining the court system. I think it's by design of the left. Uh, the far left uh, sort of leftists want to destroy any institution that works. The Democrats mostly just want to manipulate whatever system they can uh, use to stay in power and to dominate uh, uh, their opponents. What is going on that behind the scenes that may not be true based on what the media is saying. I mean, there's a lot of there there. Uh, you know, in the last week or two, we've had a series of speeches, one speech by Merrick Garland, the attorney general, one speech by the U.S. attorney for Washington, D.C. His name is Matthew Graves. And then one speech by President Trump, which many, excuse me, President Biden, which many people probably saw uh, where he's yelling and saying everyone, everyone, that, you know, that's that's not on his side are evil. Um, and what I would say that's not being covered by the uh, media is this this sort of slow and steady uh, use of government to further the ends of one political party. It doesn't matter which party. In this case, it is the Democrats. But that it's systematic use of government power, government influence. And it's not just persuasive, like our positions are better. You should trust us. No, it's it's we're going to arrest you, take away your liberty if you uh, aren't on our side. I, that That's a very different thing than we've ever seen in this country. And what I think the media and others are missing is, um, and, you know, President Trump alluded to something about this. He said something about uh, President Biden when he said, if, if you're going to say that every president can be rung up on uh, criminal charges uh, for stuff that they're doing in their job, well, he says, you know, wait till Joe Biden's out of office because there's a lot of stuff that he's done, which to most of us looks pretty lawless. So, uh, you know, we're watching a very big change in our country, a, a dramatic shift, and the media is ignoring it. Um, and they're ignoring it to the peril of our future. As a, as a country, you know, on my show, I mean, I, I talk to anybody, you know, and I try to not to carry any biases or anything like that. And I just want to note that you are a, a CNN contributor, right? To I wa well, I, wa I, wa I was, yeah, I lasted about six months and then they decided that I was uh, too conservative and I, I was canceled. I, I really was. The story is uh, the, the people admitted CNN executives admitted they were getting pressured by the black commentators on the station to not let me on because I had pushed back. I basically said anything you did on my period on, on CNN, anytime I said anything, the African-American commentators would call you racist. Didn't matter what. And it, they didn't call each other racist. They just called uh, anyone who was not with them. So, but it was a very interesting experience. I'll tell you, amazing time to uh, see how the inner workings of CNN uh, worked. And now, now you have this issue with Trump now, you know, in him, you know, claiming immunity. Uh, being the president of the United States. How does that stand up? 
Well, look, there is a there is a a, a well defined um, uh, set of laws and and rulings that a president has immunity for civil litigation. And that's been established and it's been around so that if you wanted to sue the president and said, you know, you damaged me, I'm going to make a claim against you for money. The, the, in, in, when you're in office, your conduct is, is you're immune from that. It has not been tested as to, as to criminal. And someone will say, often they'll throw up and say, well, you know, Gerald Ford, President Ford pardoned Nixon and, uh, the, the, you know, he pardoned him for something that uh, he did when he was a president. And, and, oh, there you go. So therefore, everybody is criminally liable. Well, well, Trump's point and his argument that's before the court is if you're going to criminalize decision making by a president about, in this case, uh, protecting what Trump says is he thinks the election was flawed. He was doing things that could protect the election system. If you're going to criminalize that, Trump's point is everything a president does is going to be scrutinized by his opponent if he's replaced by the opposite party. And you could indict uh, Barack Obama for droning uh, civilians. You could invite uh, indict uh, Biden for uh, leaving the border open. I think the idea that our founders had was as to the president, you have to have a sort of ability to do the job without looking over your shoulder just for that time period, you know, two terms of eight, of four years, eight years. And that's what the, the President Trump is saying is, hey, look, you may not agree with me, but I was making an effort to say, hey, this election might have been, you know, off. It might be there's a problem here. What can we do about it? And I think he he has consistently said that was his position. And he's saying, hey, you can't you can't criminalize that or the system grinds to a halt. And I think he's right on that. I, I tend to think that that you've got to uh, now it doesn't mean that you could be a president and murder somebody, you know, conduct that's outside of the scope of the of the office. But as to things that are sort of within the range of of what you're arguing about, and I think worrying about the elections and worrying about the integrity and worrying about transition, those are all uh, fair game. So when you when you look at both sides and you look at law, and if you're lawyered up on both sides, you know, each side has a battle plan, has a plan, yeah. right? And, and they know, they put out a pocket narrative, and they probably know how the other side's going to respond to that pocket narrative. You know, and it's kind of, is it tit for tat? I mean, are we getting to a point where we're just running out of law? Where there, you know, oh, I see what where, you, mean. Where, you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. well, I, I mean, look, I'm a lawyer. And when I went to be a lawyer, I grew up, my father's a lawyer. He's the first in his family to have done that. And in my, in my feeling about it, being a lawyer is a special thing in America. It's, it's you know, our crown jewels. You go to London, they have a crown jewel. They have a crown, they have crown jewels, they have a king and a queen or whatever, right? In America, our crown jewel is the Constitution and the rule of law and the values that knit us together, that you can make a deal and that you live by and all doesn't mean it's perfect. As we all know, if you're really, really rich, you can have 20 lawyers. And if you're regular, you can have one. That sometimes makes all the difference. But in general, the Constitution, the rule of law and the founding values, it's really special. And all over the world, they look at it and go, huh, that system is really, really awesome. Uh, to your point, we're watching the use of the law, the legal system, in a way that we've never seen before. And I would just say that I expect better from my uh, colleagues in the law when it comes to what we're seeing them doing. You know, there's a whole set of people after the 2020 election, they raised $25 million, something like that, and they just went out to uh, uh, punish lawyers who represented Trump. They called it the Project 65, uh, the 65 Project. They targeted 65 lawyers, spent millions of dollars to try to bar complaints and, and all kinds of things. It seems to me that's a betrayal of our system that I, I think, you know, we're running, racing towards an end of. When you see the main secretary of state, not a lawyer, you know, I'm not one of these people who thinks everybody's got to be a lawyer to have a deep thought on the Constitution. That's not American either. I actually think the bar associations and the, the legal system, the way we uh, kind of uh, sanction and, and, uh, and license our lawyers has gotten out of control. But when the secretary of state of Maine just decides... Uh, I'm taking Trump off the ballot. When the Colorado Supreme Court, with a straight face, writes a four to three decision and says, we're relying on, among other things, the, the government document, because we trust government documents. Well, I went through COVID. I went through uh, a lot of, I don't trust government documents. Don't tell me that Liz Cheney's do government document that she created on January 6th is reliable to throw Donald Trump off the court. So I, I think we're, when you say we're getting to a point, I, I don't think it's, 
even. I don't see conservatives or Republicans using the law against either we the people or against the, the political leadership. And it, it can be as dramatic as this. If you were burning courthouses, but you were Black Lives Matter, you're, you're, you're skating. In fact, a lot of you get paid. There's settlements to get paid for the people that were protesting. But if you were there on January 6th, you know, a, a few days ago, the U.S. attorney announced, we, d we decided to expand the scope. If you just walked through the wrong area, that's considered participating, and we're going to come get you. Th this, this is, um, again, it's not just that it's unfair or uneven. The system is not supposed to be used this way against we the people, and we're in danger of, of much bigger loss than just a couple hundred people going to jail, which is terrible, terrible stuff. It's a much bigger thing because of what, how central it is to what makes America work and what makes us different than the rest of the world. So I had the shaman on, on the show as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, you know, we saw the video of, you know, them escorting him in and several people in. How did that narrative change from being <laughs> escorted in the building to yeah. going to jail? Yeah, well, how did it change? I mean, that's the thing. It's uh, it's it's extraordinary, right? I mean, that poor guy. I mean, I I, I know um, exactly what he's going through from the standpoint of the legal process. Um, you know, if, if, if because a lot of my clients and the people that I've worked with have the same situation. You're you're basically charged with a misdemeanor, wrong place. You know, you're you're in the wrong place. You're you're charged with trespass, right? And a couple of different misdemeanors, and then you've got this felony, obstruction of official proceeding, which everybody's guilty of because the official proceeding was stopped. And that's not the law as it was written. That's a lie. It, it actually is a lie that the, 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 the obstruction of official proceeding had to do with evidence tampering and, and, and delivery of evidence with integrity. Evidence, not gaveling out a counting uh, moment in the court. So but, uh, 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 the, the shaman as well as others, they just lied about them. And why did they lie? What was the reason to lie? And the reason to lie was a political reason. The re reason to lie, and I, look, I represented some of these guys. To, in order to look at the video of my clients, I had to sign a protective order, which said basically said, if you share or, or, or describe or take any of this video out of this system, you, you're committing a felony and, and you're in huge trouble. And, you know, again, you not just lose your license, lose your freedom. And it was like a protective order that you would have gotten for guys that were Gitmo, for, for guys that were at Gitmo and that were suspected of being, because why? Because they needed the narrative to be about a, a terrorist act, an insurrection. No one's been charged with insurrection, not one person. You know, if they can say out loud that 60 courts uh, have looked at uh, claims of election integrity and no court has found any election integrity, now I happen to think that's a lie. Most of the courts didn't get to it. But if they can say that, I can say this. There have been no courts that have found insurrection, not one. There, 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 there haven't even been any that really found sedition. There's a couple of sedition claims that were close. But my point here is that why did they do this? They did this because you could justify the mistreatment of the prisoners and the American people, and you can brainwash people to believe it's something it wasn't so that you have a political advantage and so that you can say that group of people has to be treated differently. You should be afraid of them. And that's exactly what they've done. That's what they continue to do. And it's never been done in American. We didn't treat the protesters after Vietnam. We didn't treat, we didn't treat anyone like we're doing here. We're using the power of the law, the power of the government, and then of course the power of big tech and big media to, to lie to the, the lie about a set of people and take away their liberty. It's extraordinary. I mean, what's the underlying reason of why? I mean, what you know is—is is the government just a show? Is it a TV show? I mean, what I mean, what are we doing here? Well, I, uh, there's there's a couple answers to that. One is I think um, it's corruption, broadly speaking, small c corruption, meaning the system has gotten rotten. You know, when you if you ever have like an old, I remember we had an old walkway uh, out in the woods where I was growing up. You go hunting after a certain point, the whole thing started to rot. You know, and it's just rotten. Okay, so and there's I think there's a systemic rot in the whole of the of the big you know large and massive government. But in the case of this situation here 
you have to look a little bit more with a little sharper focus. And, and by that, I mean, what were they try? What are they trying to stop? What is it that is so threatening? Now, look, I was, you mentioned, I was the chairman of the Missouri Republican party. I was on the RNC. I, I was chief of staff to the governor of Missouri 20 years ago. I've been involved. I was election board chairman in St. Louis and Missouri. I've done a lot of different things. I've seen the inside of a lot of different spaces. The thing that Trump threatens them the most is he's not able to be owned by them. He's not even able to be consistently influenced by them. And I I have to think at a certain point, that's what threatens them the most because it doesn't make sense. He's not even as conservative as I would like. I mean, I'm a real conservative. He's kind of a half conservative. He did. He made mistakes on COVID. He made mistakes on lots of stuff, but they can't stand somebody who is not able to be controlled. And I say that carefully, but I will tell you, it looks to me like everybody else is able to be controlled in some way or other, and especially when it comes to things like the the the, uh, the international you know war making machinery that and the control in the world that kind of stuff. Uh, I worked for Phyllis Schlafly for a long time. And we talked openly about the globalists long before people started to use that term in the last few years and the influence starting after World War II down through today in terms of wanting to have a world order that is dominated by certain interests and values. And and to me, that's that, that's a big part of what's going on. But uh, mostly it comes down to power and control. There's never been power and control and money like what's in Washington, D.C. today in the history of the world. And, uh, and he's a threat. Now, this guy is a threat to their... Uh, uh, their established way of, of things working and they can't tolerate that. So they've got to destroy the whole movement that is going in, the, in that direction. Well, when tr- before Trump got in office, you know, mm-hmm. um, politics was not really a thing. So now, now it's, now it's a thing. I mean, it's changed. He shined a light on politics and, and people are diving deep. I mean, when you talk about the globalist, who are they? And why don't, why aren't we addressing that? Why aren't we talking about that? Are people scared to talk about that? Well, I would say this about, uh, you're, you're right about one thing that politics has certainly gotten a lot more attention. Uh, um, you know, my old boss, again, Phyllis Schlafly used to say, uh, politics is where the action is, meaning you can influence what happens in people's lives, you know, at the local level, as well as, uh, all the way up. Uh, uh, look, she wrote a book in 1964 called a choice, not an echo. I was just discussing with someone. It came in and around the time period where there were some people writing about, uh, how the, the world um, monetary system and the world, you know, uh, the system that, that the world interacted on at the Fed, uh, also in terms of international politics. You know, Henry Kissinger's ascent, he just died last month. I mean, he was a terrible, in my mind, he was a terrible, terrible influence on, on uh, world politics. You've got the Soviet Union, then the Chinese communists, the sort of communist thing growing. So when you say who's the globalist, there's a couple different ways you overlay that. One is the world business community, which really exploded some from about 1975 on to today where you know those are not nationalists those are those are money ists you know they're they're maximizing their corporate profits and that's has an impact right i mean that that's a, an obvious impact uh, of course the EU and the Europe and the UN have this massive infrastructure that has transformed large segments of Europe. And people say, well, and Americans say, well, you know, Europe, we're, we're sort of the successor to Europe. You know, we're America and all. Well, Europe's been around for a couple thousand years and had a weight at the center of its culture and its commerce that is really deteriorated. I mean, most of the economies in Europe, with the exception of, say, Germany, are, are really shells of what they once were. And same thing with their culture. I mean, you go to, uh, you know, go to, go to, the, go to Milan to the square, the main square at Milan on New Year's Eve, and you don't have to say whether you like it or not. I have an opinion, but it's full of uh, adult-aged Muslim men, whereas 40 years ago it was full of families and all, and Italian families. So that's a dramatic change in the country. Migration is a factor. So um, I, I, I would say the money is the pow- is the starting point, meaning multinational corporations and banks and everything else. And then uh, I-, I would say the ruling classes in these countries. Um, you know, I was reviewing a speech that uh, Bill Clinton gave in 1992 when he accepted the Democrat nomination, and he refers to one of the architects of this notion of a world order. And Bill Clinton says how great this is and how wonderful it is, and we need more of this. There's a whole set of powerful, of real leaders that came into office in these in these Western democracies 
that wanted this interwoven uh, type of, uh, of, of world order, and they went about uh, trying to get institutions built in such a way that they work, and that's, that, that's around us all the time now. You said being controlled earlier, and think about Biden. You said he had this outburst, I guess this last speech or whatever. Yeah. I mean, how is Biden off camera? I mean, is he really, really, is he, you know, when you think about a guy's 80, how old is he, 80? 80, 81, yeah, something like that. Yep. Is, he, yep. is he really, you know, is yeah. he really attuned to what what's going on? Does he really Is he really making some plays here? Well, I, you know, I haven't I haven't seen him in, in years myself. I met him a few times probably five years ago when he was v, VP and before that. But I, I think it, it's safe to say that he doesn't see that doesn't seem that way. It's safe to say that there are people around him that tend to dominate the decision making. You know, uh, one of them was Susan Rice, who's now left the White House. But John Podesta, there's a there's a, you know, a half a dozen or a, a dozen of, of these old hands that have been in and out of the Obama and Clinton and Biden White House. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't really mind that. Look, I was chief of staff to a governor. I don't mind that the uh, the principle is not the, necessarily the, the day to day in every way, but he or she has to have the hand on the on the rudder. And and if other people are rowing and other people are putting up sails, or I'm, I'm losing the metaphor, but you get the point. Then that, that's 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 fine. I mean, I I'm, but what you see more than anything, I thought you were going this direction. It's um, Joe Biden had a 50 year career in in American politics at the highest level. He, he before Menendez was arrested um, for and charged with uh, Bob Menendez, the senator from New Jersey, charged with um, uh, the, the looks like some corruption. Uh, Joe Biden was the chairman of that committee, the committee that the committee in the Senate that had the jurisdiction over massive government spending overseas for all these wars where we could spend a hundred billion dollars in the Ukraine and not know where the money went. And, 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 and if you if you know how systems work, if if you're the guy that can control a hundred billion dollars going to a place where you don't, you cannot see where the money goes. There's a good chance that people that are allied with you are going to get some of the action. Do I know that? Have, can I show you the receipt? No, but can I tell you how human beings work and what they're like in the swamp? You know, in 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 D.C. How it works. That's the kind of guy and world this guy came out of when. Burisma has millions and millions of dollars into your brother and son, and you're getting paid by them in some form. I, I'm not saying even that that's illegal. I, I don't like it. I wish it wasn't like that. I am saying when you're the president and you're making decisions about Ukraine and you're telling us one thing when we see something else is the truth or we don't know, it's a problem, right? When China is is giving communist China is giving your son access to a billion dollars, and and then you're making decisions where you say, look, it sure looks like China is getting an advantage. It's not ideal, right? This is not ideal, and that's where I think this president uh, Biden is is really the weakest we've ever seen because he has no credibility, he has no standing, and therefore it's hard to say. Well, now that he's president, he he's just on our side. But even if his family's a mess, all of our families are a mess. Don't worry too much about it. I, he just is incredible. When you think about the Democratic side, I mean, there's got to be good people on the other side. I mean, where are these people? Where are their voices? You know what I'm saying? I mean, everybody can't be bad on both. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Both sides. Yeah. You know, we, everybody's going after the jugular and, yeah, you know, right. they want to take each other out. Where are the good people on those on both sides? You know, where are those yeah. voices? Yeah. I, I mean, here's the thing I would say about that. And I, I'm not I, I'm not probably ideally situated because I, I see a lot of it up close. Um, I, I've never seen in my life the Republican Party uh, be more broadly accepting than it is now. I mean, there, there have been times in my career where the Republican Party was not accepting of a conservative like me on, say, trade. It, when I was on the RNC and I was saying, no way to multilateral trade deals. I don't want more free trade. It's killing our jobs. I was not welcome in the salons of the Republican Party. That's changed. And, and, and big time, right? On immigration at the time, I, I'm, I'm a guy that wants zero immigration. I want to pause and get a grip on what we have in this country. Pause completely because I don't, that was not acceptable. On And, and similarly on when Trump got elected, he was, his positions on criminal justice were too moderate for me. I'm a more conservative. His positions on uh, on promoting worldwide gay rights, which is what Trump was doing, too, too liberal for me. And yet I said to myself, you know what, in order to take a guy that can stand up to the Chinese communists and, and be able to stand up to the higher education and say, I'll take, I'll, I'll grow, I'll be the guy that has to, if you're a Democrat now, you can't even be pro-life. 
that there was one pro-life Congress, U.S. House member left, and, and they primaried him. Pelosi primaried the guy. He's from Chicago, and he, he lost. You, you, can't, you can't even be a pro-life Democrat. You used to be able to be pro-life. You used to be able to be anti-communist. You used to be able... And, and, and it's like this extreme set of religions. When Joe Biden's campaign manager was on, uh, I think it was Meet the Press, over the weekend, uh, he was asked, what's your priorities? Number one priority, day one, is restoring Roe v. Wade. Well, I, I mean, I understand for a chunk of the population, that's a big deal. But for most of the country, it's inflation, right? Number two was uh, insulin. Number three was school loans. And I'm thinking to myself, again, those are constituencies in a Democrat party, like, like the, the, the Green Movement. But for, the, for us, we the people... Broadly, we're looking for, you know, we're looking for lower inflation, more opportunities, more ability for our kids to dream of what's going on, not these narrow things. So I, when you say where are the, you know, uh, Democrats, you'll see these kind of people pop up I, I, and you say, well, wow, RFK Jr., he's too liberal on some issues, but he's challenging my mindset and others' mindset. That's kind of cool, right? On COVID, on, on pharma, um, Tulsi Gabbard, pretty liberal on lots of stuff and challenging, but in general, General, the par their party is so doctrinaire, and uh, and and they're really ju honestly. Uh, and again, I'm not I'm not I'm not claiming I'm impartial. I'm not. Uh, I, I am partial. But they're like they're just bullies. They're bullies, mm -hmm. and that and people don't like to be bullied. Now I think they say Trump's a bully, but I just don't. I don't. I don't see it the same way. Well, I have this theory, and I don't know if this is right or wrong. You know, yep. when you follow the money. I, this is just something I experienced, you know, when you follow the money, I experienced this, this as a kid. You know, my family was from the mountains of North Carolina. Right. So a lot of that area back in the day was they were conservative Democrats. You think about the NRA, the biggest propaganda, you know, on the Republican right. side. NRA realizes they can't sell a lot of guns in the Northeast. They move that propaganda to the South where they know they can sell a lot of guns. Then the South, really, pretty much all those conservative Democrats that were there 20 years ago, because my grandfather, you know, would have probably been a Republican today, because that, I think that was a conservative Democrat. So do we really have a Democratic Party? And you think there's any truth to that? No. How did how did that flip flop in the past 20 years? So that does that make sense? Where's the fine line there? That information. Well, I, again, I, I think I, I tend to think that politics. Is lar in the past, and it may be different now, has largely been personality driven, right? That by the time you got Reagan for a little while, there was a bunch of Democrats that were like, you know, I kind of like that guy. He was a he was a Democrat. I'm I can be a Republican now. And they tended to move. Bill Clinton was very sort of charismatic. People related to him. He was a self-made guy and all that stuff. Um, I used to say that about it. But now both parties, I think, are sort of locked in on positions. It's why you you feel like 40 percent of the country is one way and 40 percent is the other way. And in the middle, there's a little bit of movement. It's, those numbers aren't right, by the way. But what? Uh, but I, you know, I, I think um, on on say um, uh, it's one of the things that infuriates me though about calling the, the calling the Republican Party racist. The the the, the, mo the more racist party was a Democrat party until you know until the 1970s when it started to change. But it didn't mean that the Republicans became racist. It meant that they were still still where they were. But um, so I I don't know on the issues like the NRA. I, I do think. I'll give you just an example, though, about how uh, crazy it is the world is right now. And, and this, again, is not it's not nothing. What, nothing that I'm about to say is particularly illegal, but it is uh, real. The NRA has been targeted uh, by the New York attorney general. She said so uh, because they were founded in New York. They're not founded in Texas, where they're now based. And they weren't founded in Virginia, where they had their headquarters. Their founding 100 years ago was in New York. And she said, I'm going after them. And then she went after them. And they made some terrible mistakes. They had some real bad spending things and all that. But the NRA, the National Rifle Association, was one of the most, is still pretty good, but was one of the most effective get out the votes. And as you said, all they targeted is people that like their guns and gun ownership. So that was a lot of Democrats. And they could go in and they could say, vote, 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 get out the vote. And this New York attorney general basically destroyed the NRA. Now, again, self-inflicted, some of the stuff. They did some dumb spending. They did some dumb stuff. But that was a targeted lawfare, using the law to go after somebody. I, I haven't seen a Republican... Go after Planned Parenthood, for example. Planned Parenthood gets $800 million a year of federal tax dollars. They get all sorts of local tax dollars. It, it, why, why isn't, I mean, I, I'm not sure I want it. You know, I don't know if we want lawfare on every front, but that's what the other side does to us. And, and uh, so the impact of some of this 
is we get pigeonholed and we get stuck into one, uh, you know, into one area. And then the last thing I'd observe, you know, uh, uh, John, that can't be underestimated at all, I don't even know how to quantify it, is the power of the media and tech that anxiety and, ang and, and, and rage and fear motivate clicks and motivate attention. And that's what feeds us. And we're all just caught in this incredible, uh, you know, kind of vortex of, of what is most beneficial to those companies is make us all angry at each other, upset, worried, scared. And uh, that's that part of it. I don't know if we can even process. It's really only 15, 20 years that we're living with this, uh, the smartphone slash big tech that's just changing who we are. If you if you put if you take law of attraction, you apply that to political parties, and let's say somebody under let's say somebody understands that, and and you understand that hey, if I put out this pocket narrative, I realize that based on these people's law of attraction and their tone and how they re are received to things, I know how they're going to respond. Right. If I put out a pocket narrative over here to this group based on their law of attraction and their tone, I know how they're going to respond. Why don't we ever think that kind of have a bigger thought process about that and understand that as a people and say, Hey, let's look at reality here. Well, I, I, I'm with you. Uh, but I, I think, you know, when we were growing up, I don't know how much age difference you and I have. When I was growing up in my small town, um, you know, we did the Pledge of Allegiance at every every time you turned around. We did the national anthem. We did the we did the what I would call the positive brainwashing of patriotism, of, of believing in this togetherness. And we're living in a time where what appears to be the the uh, and and by the way, not just the left, right? I'm, I'm not I'm not excusing the Republicans or the conservatives because we're we're all in this, but and we're all making mistakes. But we're in a period where we're just over and over. And I, I do think the left is worse. I think that they 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 live and love to divide, and they live and love to denigrate institutions. And you know, but we we take the bait way too much. Uh, but but I, I think we're teaching our kids and teaching ourselves uh, to feel bad about things that in the past we taught ourselves to be proud of. And then you do mm -hmm. better still, right? It's be proud of your past doesn't mean you're perfect. And uh, so I, 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 while I agree with you, we should be thinking that way. We're right now we're caught in this, uh, in this, in this kind of spiral, this, uh, you know, I hope it's not a death spiral for America, but it's a spiral that's not, it's hard to, it's hard to feel a lot of real life giving things in a lot of this stuff that's happening, right? It feels sort of dead and uh, hollow. Go into your cases and you representing some of these people with the January 6th issue, you know, you got boots on the ground. What are you dealing with in your situation? Well, a couple observations there. I've never seen anything so unfair in terms of what's uh, how they're characterized, how these people are characterized. Uh, you know, uh, uh, insurrectionists and and felonious and all this stuff. And it's just they're not perfect. I mean, uh, they're not these are not, not perfect people. And and but a couple things I'll tell you that are really really tough to take. Um, if you had money. If you're middle class or upper middle class, you probably got a good enough lawyer that you're not the one stuck in jail right now. Uh, the ones that stuck in jail are working people, regular people. I don't know how you say that. Normal people. They, they, they're not worried about their mortgage. They're worried about rent, right? They're, they're not worried about their car payments. They're worried about the carburetor, right? They, when we were doing a drive at the Patriot Freedom Project right before the Christmas, we weren't trying to figure out how to, how to get a, a ski trip for the families. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to get turkey dinner, right? So... There's a part of this that's really a sort of a class warfare, too, where you're beneath us. And that's just evil stuff. As you know, bullies, really bullies are sometimes I think we recognize that bullying is like some of the most evil thing. It's so demeaning to uh, individuals. And so that's a part of this that's really uh, troubling is that there's not more of a sense of the humanity of these. And, I, you know, on Saturday or over the weekend, I was with uh, some of the families of these Jason. The kids are devastated. I mean, they're just imagine you take that away. And, you, and, and meanwhile, you, everybody's telling you your dad is a terrible human being because he was January 6th. And, and before that, he served in the military with honor. You know, he served in the, in the law enforcement with honor. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's such a mean thing. And then the final point on this that's so troubling is the, the willingness of, of participate, uh, the participants who are willing to be a part of this, that 
I feel like should know better. Uh, you know, Pelosi and Liz Cheney and the Congress, they spent almost $20 million. The select committee, they lied about it. They didn't get to the bottom of the pipe bomber. They didn't get to the bomb, bottom of the, the guy that built the, the gallows and the noose. I mean, they, they, they just basically said these were terrible people. You know, I've looked at thousands of hours of video. I've gone into the house thing. I've gone to the, my clients. And when you watch it, you know, 99.9% are normal people. And they're going through the building and they're trying to figure out what to do. And it's a cold day and they're talking to each other. 1% or 0.1% got out of hand. And some got out of hand in really crappy ways. But we now know there's lots of things about the whole day that were hard to figure out and, and hard to understand how they could be allowed to happen. I, I mentioned I was chief of staff to the governor in Missouri. When, when we would have major public events, I would get a briefing by law enforcement on what to expect. Uh, you know, and we would know that there was intelligence assets in the crowds at the 4th of July event. When Ferguson happened and they burned Ferguson to the ground, I was chairman of the Missouri Republican Party, but my friends were cops. They had, they had infiltrated the, the, the guys that were burning Ferguson down to get intelligence, right? They had assets in there. That's how this always happens. So something didn't work on January 6th dramatically. And the people that are participating in making this sound so evil are the people who should be better they're, they're supposed to be the elite, the, the lawyers, the judges, the, the government. And instead, they're, 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 they're just dragging the country and these people through this hellish uh, thing. And, and the only way I can justify it or can just, I can see what they're doing is that they're, they're trying to hang on to power and they're trying to hang on to influence and they're, and, and they're willing to do anything to have that. And it's, it's just, it's like watching, it's like watching a crime happen every day when you see how this is going on and what's happening. And you're wondering why no one will stop it, will join you in stopping it. I mean, do you think because we're so divided, do you think that it's, you know, if I'm on this side, if I'm on this Democratic side and because we're so divided on all these issues, do you think it's, you know, this guy might be a good person, but you think it's ego that they fall in line with everybody else? Well, I, I you know, because I have such a, a, a I, I, I think a, I like to think I have a, an informed and faithful uh, understanding of human beings and myself and my own failings and my own, uh, that I don't know whether it's ego, um, but, or fear. I know that there was some very interesting writing, um, uh, uh, done during the Soviet communist era. One of the, one of the essays was called the power of the powerless. And it was about, uh, uh one of the segments was about a shop owner and, and the shop owner would put a sign in the window that said, uh, workers of the world unite. And the, the writer who was describing this said, he's not doing it because he believes in that. He's not even doing it so he signals to the communists that he's on their side. He's doing it so you can go into the place and not be afraid, a shopper. And, and he goes into this. And my point there is that it's complicated why people are complicit and why they're not standing up. And so it's very difficult. I, I don't judge my own family. I have people close to me. I mean, not my immediate family, but like my, my extended family where they, they think the J sixers were truly evil. They think they were, they were planning an insurrection that they were going to take over the country all, and, and they and they can't believe uh, uh, that I work with them. Right. And so uh, it's hard to understand, but uh, so I don't know if it's ego only, I, but I, I, I go back and I say leaders, leaders have a responsibility to help the people that are in their group or their tribe or their family. As a father, I have a responsibility to my kids to lead them, not to tell them what to do, but to inform what they're doing. We have leaders around us that are lying to people, that are misleading people, that are manipulating people in a direction that's so unholy, it's so un, un uh, you know, so not kind that it's really hard to understand that. That, that, that part of it's haunting. I mean, uh, I actually think Joe Biden is kind of addled. So when I see him yell and scream, I think, what's sadness? I mean, I, my wife works with senior citizens and I, I know a lot of, and I think this is a sadness. But on another level, I look at some of these people that are, that are, that are kind of bragging. Ma Matthew Graves, this, this, this uh, prosecutor, bragging about just destroying people's lives. It's, it's haunting. It's very, very odd. I mean, when you look at it, I mean, because if you just look at it from a rational standpoint, you, you can see where the darkness is from my perspective. I don't care what part of you're on. 
So it's just like, I'm just like, are people asleep at the wheel or, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just very odd to me. Um, cause I try to weigh, you know, anybody's opinion and try to de de decipher what the deal is, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, people ask me, what can you do? And, and, and I, and, then, and there's one thing that you can do one thing I, I get lots of ways to answer, but one thing I often come back to, and it may sound a little bit, um, it sounds a little Pollyannish sometimes when I say it out loud, but, but having an openness to try to communicate on this stuff, right? And try to, we have to break the hoax. We have to break the spell for each other, for all of us. You know, we, we all get locked into our, our uh, silos and it, it, it takes a lot more courage to uh, engage and break out of that than it does to, you know, post on X or, or, you know, do an Instagram post. And so, you know, I, I, I encourage people that say, Oh, you know, what can, what can I do? What can I do? Try to find some ways to engage people, try to find some ways to be good to each other. I, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, I think you used the phrase, it's a, it's a strange time. It's also a scary time for a lot of people. And, and one of the, again, one of the worst frustrations I have with this president, president Biden is he's a one trick pony. And by that, I mean, he doesn't have an argument that he wants to win. He just wants to scare people and, and people do get scared. And, and, you know, I tell people all the time, COVID, again, I mentioned my wife works with uh, seniors, senior citizens are like little kids, you know, our old, our elders are like little kids. They get scared. They, 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 they got a lot that they're uncertain of. They don't have as much and, and people get scared and being scared is really, really crappy. It's really bad. And if you're lonely and scared and this guy, this president, that's his one trick is to try to scare people, be afraid, be afraid be afraid. It's, it's like the least life giving thing you can do. So, you know, I, I worked years ago. Uh, I, I worked years ago, John, with, uh, uh, John Paul, the second, the Pope, I, I was, I, he, he appointed me to go to Rome and I went for a month and I worked in his office with him and others. And if you read his writings, he came back to, he, he lived through the, the, the Germans. He had seen the Holocaust. He, the friends that were executed. I mean, he'd been through a, a hell of a time period in history and he constantly returned to be not afraid. And to the fact that Christ calls us to not be afraid. So it, it, when the world is saying fear and our president is saying fear, try to find your way back to what Christ was teaching and teaches us, which is be not afraid and try to spread that because we owe it to each other to have that. That's our best. And, uh, and it's a, it's, it's, as you said, it's a strange time. Well, I mean, I think, um, I think people come insulary within yes. their own environment. Yep, and I true. think that I, th I think there's a certain age range because I see it sometime on my parents, you know, they're, my parents are 77. And I think that age range of people just because, you know, yep. that was Amer that what they lifted was Americana. You know, when you become insular in your own environment and society is over here, you're not paying attention to society and it's passing you by and you don't let that play a part in your decision making, I think that creates some problems as well. Yeah, I, call this, I call it the country club effect because I think sometimes some of the richest people in the world are dumb as hell because if you if you're rich, you go to the city, you yep. work all day, you come home, you go to the country club, everybody in the country club greets you, they love you, you right. start to believe your own bullshit, uh -huh. and you. And you kind of forget out here what really society is doing. I yeah. think there's an, an age range that is is hung up in there where they're not really paying attention of, of other things that are pushing society a different direction, if you will. Yeah, I like that. I think that sounds right to me. I think that's I think that's right. And we all fall. We'll all fall for that. Right. That's the we all fall into that trap. We can fall into that trap. So, uh, you know, whatever we can do um, uh, to break out of that's important. So. Yeah, thank you for the chance to talk. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, best of luck to you. Yeah. This has been Attorney Ed Martin, and I am John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Thank you.